Welcome back to Esther's Legacy, for we are here for such a time as this. I want to go ahead and ask you to like and share the video. Today we are going to be discussing Babylon the Great. And so I want us to look at chapters 17 and 18 today. We will primarily be discussing chapter 17, but there are themes in our discussion that will actually go into chapter 18. So to start out with, I want to go through and read chapters 17 and 18 in one sitting. So let's get started. Then came one of the angels with the seven bowls, and he said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who is sitting on many waters. And the kings of the earth went whoring with her, and the people living on earth have become drunk from the wine of her whoring. He carried me off in the spirit to a desert, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, filled with blasphemous names, and having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, and glittered with gold, precious stones, and pearls. In her hand was a gold cup, filled with the obscene and filthy things produced by her whoring. On, on her forehead was written a name with a hidden mean, meaning, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of the earth's obscenities. I saw the woman drunk from the blood of God's people. That is, from the blood of the people who testify about Yeshua. On seeing her, I was altogether astounded. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astounded? I will tell you the hidden meaning of the woman and, the, and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that was carrying her. The beast you saw once was, now is not, and will come up from the abyss, but it is on its way to destruction. The people living on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life since the founding of the world will be astounded to see the beast that once was, now is not, but is to appear. This calls for a mind with wisdom, and the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman is sitting. Also, they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is now, and one is yet to come. And when he does come, he must remain a little while. And the beast, which once was and now is not, is an eighth king. It comes from the seven and is on its way to destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet begun to rule, but they receive power as kings for one hour along with the beast. They have one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will go to war against the lamb but the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are called, chosen, and faithful will overcome along with him. Then he said to me, The waters that you saw where the whore is sitting are peoples, crowds, nations, and, multi and languages. And languages. As for the ten horns that you saw and the beast, they will hate the whore. Bring her to ruin, leave her naked, eat her flesh, and consume her with fire. For God put it in their hearts to do what will fulfill his purpose. That is, to be of one mind and give their kingdom to the beast. And till God's words have accomplished their intent. And the woman you saw is the great city, 
that rules over the kings of the earth. Chapter 18 After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was lit up by his splendor. He cried out in a strong voice, She is fallen, she is fallen, Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons, a prison for every unclean spirit, a prison for every unclean hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of God's fury caused by her whoring. Yes, the kings of the earth went whoring with her, and from her unrestrained love of luxury, the world's businessmen have grown rich. Then I heard another voice out of heaven say, My people, come out of her, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not be infected by her plagues, for her sins are a sticky mass piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Render to her as her as she rendered to others, pay her back double for what she has done. Use the cup in which she has brewed to brew her a double sized drink. Give her as much torment and sorrow as the glory and luxury she gave herself. For in her heart she says, I sit a queen. I am not a widow. I will never see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in a single day, death, sorrow, and famine, and she will be burned with fire, because Adonai, God, her judge, is mighty. And the kings of the earth, who went whoring with her and shared her luxury, will sob and wail over her when they see the smoke as she burns standing at a distance from fear for fear of her torment they will say oh no the great city babylon the mighty city in a single hour your judgment has come and the world's businessmen weep and mourn over her because no one is buying their merchandise anymore Stocks of gold and silver, gems and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, all rare woods, all ivory goods, all kinds of things made of scented wood, brass, iron and marble, cinnamon, cardamom, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, flour, grain, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies and people's souls. The fruits you lusted for with all your heart have gone. All the luxury and flashiness have been destroyed, never to return. The sellers of these things who got rich from her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, and saying, Oh no, the great city used to wear fine linen, purple and scarlet. She glittered with gold, precious stones and pearls. Such great wealth in a single hour ruined. All the shipmasters, passengers, sailors, and everything or every one making his living from the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke and she as she burned what city was like the great city and they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned saying oh no the great city the abundance of her wealth made all the ship owners rich in a single hour she is ruined rejoice over her heaven rejoice people of god emissaries and prophets 
for in judging her, God has vindicated you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a great millstone and hurled it into the sea, saying, With violence like this will the great city Babylon be hurled down never to be found again. And the sound of harpists and musicians, mu musicians, flute players and trumpet, trumpeters will never again be heard in you. No worker of any trade will ever again be found in you. The sound of a meal will never again be heard in you. The lamp or the light of a lamp will never again shine in you. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will never again be heard in you. For your businessmen were the most powerful on earth. All the nations were deceived by your magic spell. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's people. Indeed, of all who have ever been slaughtered on earth. Mystery Babylon. This is the city, the part of the Antichrist kingdom that is responsible for its economic prosperity. So let's go back and let's begin to break some of this down. Primarily, like I said, we will be breaking down chapter 17 today. We will save chapter 18 for next time. I wanted it to I wanted to read it all together because some of the themes of some of the things we will talk about today bleed into chapter 18. And so I wanted you to get a feel for both chapters. Babylon the Great is the great prostitute, the great whore. This city as it's spoken of, it is a city, it will be a city, and yet this system of Babylon per, pervades the world and it has pervaded time. It is one of those things that is kind of hard to get your hand on um, in a tangent way completely because it not only will be across the world, but it has gone back through time. Okay, This great prostitute goes all the way back, not only to Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, but it even goes back to the Tower of Babel. When man wanted to build a city and a tower to make a name for themselves to go against God. That is when Babylon started this side of the flood. And so this great prostitute, she's had different names throughout time. And one of those names actually is Tyre. When we read Isaiah 23, Isaiah 23 actually has many of the same descriptions of Babylon the Great that we just read, but it is referring those descriptions to the city of Tyre in the time of Isaiah. The city of Tyre in the time of Isaiah was an island. It was not a peninsula. Alexander the Great made it a peninsula. But in Isaiah's time, it was an island. And this island was an island of merchants. They, they were Phoenician. They had many ships. Ships came from other places came to them. This is the territory this is the territory of Phoenicia. This is the territory of 
Hiram. Hiram is the Phoenician king that helped David and Solomon build the temple. So part of her history was built on helping the people of God build the temple. A godly history. But like many throughout time, things that even start good became corrupted. Entire became corrupted by the luxuries of her merchants. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah chapter 23. And I'm just going to pick out a few verses to highlight, okay? In verse 1, a prophecy about Tyre, how you Tarshish ships because the harbor is destroyed. Okay, we, we saw in Revelation how Babylon is destroyed and the merchants, those who make their living by way of the sea, are devastated at the destruction of Babylon, of the future Babylon. Verse 2, silence, you who live on the coast, you who have been enriched by the merchants of Sidon crossing the sea. Sidon was kind of a sister city to Tyre. It was the city uh, Phoenicia that was actually inland. So it was the capital city of the Phoenician territory, but it got its wealth from Tyre. Verse 3. By the great water, the grain of Succor, the harvest of the Nile, brought you prophets. She was marketplace for the nations. She was the marketplace for the nations. And so see, we have here also a hint of what the future Babylon the Great will be. It will be a marketplace for the nations. Babylon the Great will be an international city. Keep that in mind. Let's go over to verse 8. Who planned this against Tyre, the city that once bestowed crowns, whose merchants are princes, whose traders are honored throughout the earth? Adonai, Zavot, the Lord of hosts, planned it. But who was this Tyre that God planned her destruction, even though she was so wealthy and so powerful, God planned her destruction. Who was she? Let's go down to verse 15. And when that day comes, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years. The lifetime of a king after 70 years, its fate will be the same as that of the prostitute in this song. Take the lyre, work the, walk the city. You poor, forgotten whore, play sweetly, sing all your songs so that they will remember you. Who is she? She's a forgotten whore, a, pro a prostitute, a forgotten prostitute. After 70 years are over, Adonai will remember Tyre and she will receive her wages again and prostitute herself to all the world's kingdoms on the face of the earth. Adonai will remember you, and what will you do with that? Instead of turning to Adonai, you will once again pros prostitute yourself to the kingdoms of the earth. But her merchandise and profits will be dedicated to Adonai. They will not be stored up or hoarded because 
her prophets will be for those living in Adonai's presence so that they can eat their fill and wear fine clothing. In other words, God is going to take what's come in to you because you have not followed him. He's going to take it instead of letting you have it. He's going to take it and give it to the people who worship him. Okay. All right. That is Tyre. I want now to look at the idea of that Babylon the Great is on many waters. And we're going to look at some more scripture, so don't worry, that's about Babylon, specifically about Babylon, the actual ancient city of Babylon. And, and by the way, the ancient city of Babylon is still to this day in ruins, complete ruins. Nothing has been built on what was the ancient city of Babylon. There are buildings around the ancient city of Babylon, but the territory that was actually the ancient city still to this day lies in ruins. Okay? So here we have the great whore, the great prostitute on many waters. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter Chapter 13, Jeremiah, I'm sorry, chapter 51. One of the verses we will specifically look at is 13. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 51. I'm having a hard time talking today. So Jeremiah chapter 51. Let me read verse 13 first, and then we're going to go back. And we're actually going to read segments of this chapter as well. This chapter is actually about the city of Babylon. So verse 13 says, You who live near plenty of water, so rich in treasure, your end has come, your time for being cut off. So ancient Babylon was also on many waters. It was on uh, in the territory of the rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates. And so it had merchants coming through Babylon by river into the city. Its port was actually inside the city walls. Okay. So it sat on many waters. But we saw from Revelation that the many waters that is actually being talked about with Babylon the Great are many waters peoples okay remember the waters the sea represent the nations the peoples of the earth but let's highlight some of these verses in chapter 51 i'll tell you what verse i'm on i'm going to start in verse 2 i'm going to read the first part of verse 2 against babylon i will send foreigners now, in Revelation, in Revelation, God is going to cause the kings who side with the Antichrist to actually go against Babylon. So basically, you're going to have the kingdom of the Antichrist, Babylon, going against the economic system of the Antichrist, Babylon. So this kingdom of Babylon is going to go against itself. All right? In this case, in Jeremiah 51, of course, when uh, Jeremiah is talking about this specifically, he was referring to the Medo-Persians who would come against Babylon. Okay, let's go down to verse 6. Flee! From Babylon, let each one save his life. Don't perish because of her guilt. We saw that idea in chapter 18 of Revelation. Come out of her, my people. Don't share in her sin or the plagues that will result. 
eventually in the Exodus, of course, God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. But even before he did that, he definitely made a distinction between his people and the people of Egypt. So that Israel didn't share in all of the plagues of Egypt. They shared in some, but not all of them. Verse 7. Babylon was a gold cup in the hands of Adonai. It made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. This is why the nations have lost their senses. Babylon has suddenly fallen. Second part of verse 9. So leave her alone, and each of us will return to his own country. Verse 10. Adonai has brought forth our victory. Come, let us proclaim to Zion the work of Adonai our God. So God is the one who brings victory. And it is proclaimed in Zion. It is proclaimed in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel. Second part of verse 11. He, Adonai, plans to destroy Babylon. This is the vengeance of Adonai. Vengeance over his temple. Vengeance over his temple. And will not the kingdom of the Antichrist, which includes the great prostitute, which includes Mystery Babylon, will not that kingdom defile the temple of God in Jerusalem? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. And just as a reminder... An important reminder, the Antichrist would not be able to desecrate God's temple if it were not a consecrated holy temple, which means God cares about what is happening in that place and that God is accepting worship from the worship and the worshipers in that place. Let's go over to verse 24. Well, actually, let's go back up to verse 20 because we see some themes in verse 20 that we read in Revelation. Babylon, you are my war club and weapons of war. With you, I shatter nations. With you, I destroy kingdoms. With you, I shatter horses and their riders. With you, I shatter chariots and their drivers. With you, I shatter husbands and wives. With you, I shatter young and old. With you, I shatter young men and virgins. With you, I shatter shepherds and their flocks with you i shatter shadow i shatter farmers and their teams with you i shatter governors and deputies why did i want to read that because she goes too far babylon goes too far way beyond what god needed her to do and she will go way too far as the system of the antichrist in the end and God will pay her back double for what she does. So that there's no more sound of even the bride and the bridegroom. No more sound of the, the flute or the lyre. No more of what you expect to hear out of a city that's prosperous and powerful. Okay? Verse 24, but I will repay Babylon and all living in the land of the Kazdim, okay, the Babylonians. 
For all the evil they did to Zion, says Adonai, before your eyes, Judah, before your eyes, I'm going to pay them back. And Revelation says they'll get paid back double. They'll get paid back double. Verse 27, rise up, or raise up a banner in the land, blow a shofar among the nations, prepare the nations for war against her, summon kingdoms against her, Ararat, Mini, Ashkenaz. Verse 28, prepare the nations against her, the kings of the means, his governors and deputies, and all the land he controls. Bring these people against her. God will bring others against Babylon. In the case of Babylon the Great, in Revelation, he's going to bring Babylon's own allies against her. Her own allies. Let's go to verse 35. But one who lives in Zion will say, May my torn flesh be avenged on Babylon. And Jerusalem will say, May my blood be avenged on the Kazdim, on the Babylonians. So this idea of the flesh and blood of God's people being spilt and torn apart, be paid back double. Let's go to verse 44. I will punish Bel of Babel in Babylon. Bel was their, their main deity. It's another name for Marduk. And Bel actually also had other titles such as God of the air, God of the earth, and And the water and under the water, okay? God of the air really stood out to me, though, because Satan is the prince of the air, isn't he? That one really stood out to me. And so what's he saying here? I will punish Bel in Babylon and make him disgorge what he swallowed. The nations will no longer flow to him. Babylon's wall will fall. Get out of her, my people, each one, save yourself for Adonai's fur or from Adonai's furious anger. Let's go down to verse 49. Just as Babylon caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon will fall the slain of all the land. You who escape the sword, go. Don't stand still. Remember Adonai from afar. Let Jerusalem come into your minds. The reproaches we have heard have put us to shame. Disgrace covers our faces because foreigners have entered the sanctuaries of Adonai's house. Because foreigners have entered the sanctuary of Adonai's house house oh how powerful is that so next time you hear someone speak in terms of the temple that will come that is coming and call it the temple of the antichrist no no it is the temple of god the antichrist will be an invader An invader. All right. Actually, for your homework this week, I want you to go back and I want you to read all of Isaiah 23 about Tyre and all of Jeremiah 51 about Babylon. Okay? So read those two chapters as your homework. There is a lot there. And this is what John is drawing on when he is speaking about the fall of Babylon in chapters 17 and 18 of Revelation. All right. Now, let's look back at Revelation. Let's go to chapter 17. And 
let's see. What does it say in terms of what she was wearing? What is this whore, this prostitute, Babylon the Great, what is she wearing? The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and glittered with gold, precious stones and pearls. And in her hand was a gold cup filled with the obscene and filthy things produced by her whoring. Okay? So she is wearing this purple and scarlet and glittered in gold. Right? Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28 would also be a good one for you to sit down and read in entirety. It is... Um, the section we are going to read is actually about Tyre. Let's look at 11 through 19. We've talked about Tyre and Isaiah. This here also is about Tyre. The word of Adonai came to me, son of man, raise a lament for the king of Tyre and tell him that Adonai Elo what Adonai Elohim says. You put the seal on perfection. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, covered with all kinds of precious stones, carnelians, topaz, diamonds, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphires, green feldspar, emeralds, your pendants and jewels, were made of gold, prepared the day you were created. You were a cherub protecting a large region. I placed you on God's holy mountain. You walked back and forth along stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Now, of course, this also here is a description of what many will say is a description of Satan himself. Okay? But again, I want us to remember, and of course, Satan was in essence the king of Tyre. But I want us to also remember that Tyre, again, its king, Hiram, helped with the building of the temple. And the place in the temple, the holy place, is considered the Garden of Eden. So you have here a description of this king that has fallen, of Satan even, who has fallen. But listen to what it's, it's talking about. Let's start in verse 16. When your commerce grew... You became filled with violence, and in this way you sinned. Therefore, I have thrown you out defiled from the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, protecting cherub, from among the stones of fire. Your heart grew proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom all your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, but I have thrown you on the ground. Your before kings I have made you a spectacle by your many crimes in dishonest trading, you have profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore I brought forth fire from within you and it has devoured you i reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who see you all who know you among the peoples will be aghast at you you are an object of terror and you will cease to exist so at the same time that God is giving a description of Satan, 
He's also giving a description of the king of Tyre and of Tyre itself. You cannot separate Satan from his kings and from his kingdom any more than you can separate God, any more than you can separate Messiah Yeshua from Israel. God the God is in covenant with Israel. In covenant with Israel. And the Messiah is the messenger of that covenant. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the word made flesh. He is the one who makes that covenant and the one who will fulfill the covenant on earth as king of Israel. God has made covenant with Israel and you cannot separate Messiah from Israel. Matter of fact, there is actually a verse in Isaiah 63 Isaiah 63 that says that very thing. Verse 9, in all their troubles, Israel's troubles, he was troubled, the Messiah. Then the angel of his presence, Messiah, saved them. In his love and pity, he redeemed them. So you cannot separate God from his people. You cannot separate Satan from his people. And so here we see in Ezekiel chapter 28 that at the same time it's speaking in terms of Satan, it's also speaking in terms of the king, and it's also speaking in terms of Tyre. And Tyre is another example of Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon. Verse 5 in, in chapter 17 of Revelation says, On her forehead was written a name with a hidden meaning or Mystery, mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and the earth's obscenities. Babylon the Great. This it's a mystery because it's 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 not as clear cut as you might think. You know, it's it's not necessarily the ancient actual city of Babylon. But this is the kingdom of Babylon that goes back in time, all the way back to the Tower of Babel, back to the time of the kingdom of Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. Satan's kingdoms, the kingdoms that Satan has worked through. Babylon the Great. Let's look at Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 30, or if you're in a Jewish Bible, that's going, that's going to be verse 27. The king said, this is Nebuchadnezzar, the king said, Babylon the great. I built it as a royal residence by my power and force to enhance the glory of my majesty, says Nebuchadnezzar. I did this. And what happens to him as soon as he says those words? 
he becomes like an animal and he is put out of the city for seven years. He loses his mind for seven years. That is what happens to Nebuchadnezzar when this pride that was spoken about in Ezekiel chapter 28 about Tyre and the king of Tyre and Satan, this pride that swelled up in his heart came flowing out of his mouth. God may allow things to happen, but he allows them to happen for his purpose. Not, not to glorify Satan or the Antichrist. No. He lets things happen to fulfill his purpose. And then we see that this woman was drunk from the blood of God's people. And we have a description here of God's people. The description that is given here of God's people. It is not, he does not say Israel here. He says from the blood of the people who testify about Yeshua. Now, that is Israel. Once the Messiah came on the scene, the loyalty of the people needed to go toward their king. And for many of them in Israel, it did. For many of them, it did not. Here at the end, though, this is the end. Babylon is about to fall. Messiah is coming for his people. We're about to have here in this particular scene, okay, is chapter 17, 18, goes into 19. What do you have in 19? The wedding between the bride and the groom, okay, between the bride and the lamb. Israel is his bride. Israel is his wife. But we see here another description of Israel or the people of God. It is those who testify about Yeshua. That he is the Messiah. Now, for those who are still on the fence, for those Jewish people who are still on the fence, when he actually returns and they see him face to face, they will repent. But for the most part, you have seen by the time we're about to get to him returning, you have already seen the 144,000. You've seen many of Israel escape. You have seen the two witnesses testifying about Yeshua. You've seen them testifying. And so by this point, many, if not most, of the Jewish people have become believers in Yeshua. Believers in Yeshua and Israel are synonymous. Why? Because you cannot separate God from his people. You cannot separate Messiah from his people. They go together. They go together. As a matter of a fact, what we see here in chapter 17 in the discussion of the great harlot, the whore, the prostitute, this mystery Babylon, it is the exact opposite from Revelation chapter 12, where we saw another woman, Israel, the bride of God, the wife of God, the bride of the Lamb. Okay? It is the exact opposite. Babylon is the opposite of Jerusalem. The dragon, Satan, is the opposite of God, the Antichrist, this beast, 
what may turn out to be the Mahdi is the opposite of Yeshua. And the false prophet is the opposite of the Holy Spirit. Okay? The false prophet proclaims and points people to the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit testifies about the truth of God's word and points people to Yeshua, the Messiah of God. So you have exact opposites here. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. They are exact opposites. However, they are not equal in power and glory and honor. Not at all. The kingdom of the Antichrist, the kingdom of Satan, will appear to be winning when Yeshua returns, when Messiah comes. But Messiah will put an utter end to that. By the word of his mouth, it will be no contest. I actually want to look at that because if you go to chapter, I'm sorry, verse 14, you see that these kings will go to war against the Lamb. That's Armageddon. But the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are called, chosen, and faithful will overcome along with him. Y'all, we are called. We are chosen. And we are called to be faithful to the end. We are called. Our calling is to follow Yeshua. That is our calling. Just like when he called the disciples. He said, follow me. That's our calling. And we are chosen. He chose us. Just like he told the disciples. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I chose you to be fruitful. I chose you so that you would be fruitful. And with the kind of fruit that lasts, lasts to the end, that is faithful, that is faithful to the very end. That is who we are to be. And the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us be that person. But if we look here, we also see that the idea of being chosen is not just that idea of what Yeshua tells his disciples in chapter 15 of John, but it's also being that chosen nation and made a part of that chosen nation, Israel. That's what God told them they would be to him, a chosen nation, a chosen people, a treasured people. In Exodus 19, and Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, uses that same language of being a chosen nation. And then to be faithful, faithful to the end. Let's go to Philippians. I want us to read those verses that many of us know very well. But Philippians chapter 3. Let's look at 12 and 13. It is not that I have obtained, already obtained it, right? Let's go back so we know what he's obtaining, okay? Let's go back. To verse 10, yes, I gave it all up, the things he had before coming to Yeshua. He gave them up in order to know him, that is, to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings as I am being conformed to his death. It is not so that somehow I might arrive at being resurrected from the dead. 
so that he might be faithful to the end to be resurrected from the dead. It is not that I have already obtained it or already reached the goal. No, I keep pressing or pursuing it in the hope of taking hold of that for which Messiah Yeshua took hold of me. Brothers, I, for my part, do not think of myself as having yet gotten hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining forward toward what lies ahead. Verse 14, I keep pursuing the goal in order to win the prize offered by God's upward calling in Messiah Yeshua. I'm pressing on. I'm going to keep pursuing him. I'm not going to say I've already obtained it. I'm not going to consider it. I'm not going to consider that I've already obtained it. I want to keep going. I want to go to the end. I want to keep pursuing him. I don't want to stop. I want to be faithful to the end. Because what is ahead? The resurrection. The resurrection. And so, yes, the Holy Spirit helps us to come to Yeshua. He helps us be faithful to Yeshua. Okay. He is the opposite of the false prophet who speaks lies. Lies. And yet the Holy Spirit in John is known as the Spirit of Truth. He has that title in chapters 14 and 16. The Spirit of Truth. He convicts the world. He draws us to Yeshua. He's the Spirit of Truth. He guides us into all truth. And He causes us to walk in the ways of God. Amen? That's Ezekiel. All right, we know that in verse 9, in verse 9, where it says in chapter 17 of Revelation, that there are seven heads, and these are seven hills, or seven kings. We talked about this last week, that these are, and the week before that, as a matter of fact, these are the seven kingdoms of the past going into even the, the future. So we have the seven kingdoms, right, of Egypt, of Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the Islamic Empire, and then the Empire of the Antichrist. Okay? All of those compose the kingdom of of Babylon the Great. Of Babylon the Great. Some of these verses in chapter 17 we are skipping over because we've already discussed them in connection to the Antichrist. And so let's go to verse 15. Verse 15 of chapter 17 says, then he said to me, the waters that you saw where the whore is sitting are peoples, crowds, nations, and languages. Remember, we talked about Babylon being an international city. International. And this is where uh, you'll see a false unity of peoples, of people coming together. It is not the unity. It is not for the oneness that Yeshua prayed for for his people. This is a false unity. Okay? So this city is going to be an international city. Now, I know that many people in the past have talked about this city as being Rome. Um, we read an account where we have a similar description of Tyre. 
We read a similar description of the ancient city of Babylon. But this particular city will be a part of the Antichrist kingdom. And so if the Antichrist kingdom is a rebirth Islamic kingdom, then it stands to reason that this city will be in an Islamic nation and it is technically an Islamic city. Now, I know that um, Joel Richardson, if you're uh, familiar with him, he believes that that city is Mecca. But there's also another possibility that he even talks about, and that is the city of Neom that Saudi Arabia is currently building. It is being put forth as what they describe as an international city. They want it to be an international city, a place of commerce and trade. And it fits perfectly this description of, of the future Babylon the Great. Could it be that city that Saudi Arabia is building today? Neo, which includes that city, that line city. This city is going to draw many to come and trade. It will be an economic arm of the Islamic world and even the world. And I know many have talked about Babylon the Great and that, that city of commerce also being perhaps the United States or New York City. Uh, Y'all, we're on the decline. We're not on the rise. We're on the decline, unfortunately. In many ways, China has taken our place. But I do not believe this is a description of any city in China. So sometimes we have to stop thinking so American-centric. We may not, as a nation, survive up to this point. So we have to be careful of thinking this is a description of America. We are far removed. Yes, we're on many waters. Yes, we are an international nation. But we are on the decline. Our economy is not anywhere what it once was. Unfortunately. But... We have to be careful in our suggestions because to Israel because we also don't want to be Egypt. We don't want to be someone who promises aid and, and support and then pulls back because they're not doing what we want them to do. We also have to be careful not to suggest dividing the nation of Israel. Because that's also one of the reasons Yeshua comes back. And he will judge the nations that have divided his land. That's in Joel chapter 3. So we have to be careful as a nation. And we have to realize that sometimes our leaders are making decisions not based on the word of God. And I know many of you know that. But let's keep our eyes open. Okay, We don't want to be Egypt. I do not think, I do not believe, I could be wrong, but I do not believe we are Babylon. In terms of Babylon the Great. The future economic hub of the Antichrist world. 
Because that's what Babylon is. God is going to put into the hearts. We see this in verse 17. Let's just read through verse 16. As for the ten horns that you saw and the beast, they will hate the whore. Bring her to ruin. Leave her naked. Eat her flesh and consume her with fire. They will not like her. And if it is correct that it is either Mecca or... Uh, Neil, I can definitely see why the Islamic world is not going to like Neil. Because it will be an international city. And although it may be technically an Islamic city, it will allow everything else in. Because it will be an international city. And even in terms of Mecca, even though uh, Muslims must make pilgrimage to Mecca once in a lifetime, according to their theology, Many in the Islamic world, Iran, for instance, they don't like Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia and Iran are very much at odds. And so if this particular city, if this particular future Babylon the Great is somewhere in Saudi Arabia, it is not hard to imagine the system of... Um, the kingdom of the Antichrist not liking that city. Okay. So you have God putting into the hearts of these kings to go against that city to get rid of her because she will be a decadent city. She will kill God's people. She will sell God's people into captivity. And therefore, God will judge her. She will be a city of pride, of decadence, of filth. She may look good on the outside. She may be in gold and, and purple and scarlet and precious stones and pearls on the outside. But she will be a filthy city. How does it describe it in chapter 17, verse, what is that, verse 4? In her hand was the cup filled with the obscene and filthy things produced by her whoring. She's going after everybody. And every filth that there is. Verse 18. And the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. How does... How does that future Babylon rule over the kings of the earth, she holds the money strings. She holds the money strings. Um, we're trying to hold money strings in some ways with Israel right now, which we have to be very careful of. That is not our place. It is not our place to do that. Our place is strictly to say, Israel, what do you need? We're here for you. We're here for you. Even if we pull out of every other area of the world, we need to be there for Israel. Because this is the battle that, that matters more than anything. Because it's not just a physical battle. It is very much a spiritual battle. Very much a spiritual battle. Make no mistake about that. Zechariah talks about Jerusalem becoming a cup of reeling, that these nations, 
will reel over Jerusalem. They will not be able to move her. But the enemy will go after her. You might want to read Zechariah 12 through 14. Jerusalem will be a cup of reeling, even more than it is today. This great city I want to I want to say something here. Let's let's look at chapter fourteen, verse eight, which says, "Another angel, a second one, following followed, saying, she has fallen, she has fallen, Babylon the Great. She made all the nations drink the wine of God's fury, caused by her whoring. She's going to make all." the nations drink God's cup of fury. It's not just going to be that city that drinks it. All the nations will have to drink it too because they went after her. They sided with her. They wanted her luxuries. They want her money. They want her fortune. That is Babylon the Great. There's another verse um, that speaks of a great city, of, but it's a little different. It's in chapter 11, verse 8, and it says this, And their dead bodies, that's the two witnesses, will lie in the main street of the great city, whose name, to reflect its spiritual condition, is Sodom and Egypt, the city where their Lord was ex executed on the cross. Okay. Now, that's Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is not Babylon. But when we see that verse in chapter 11, this is at the end. This is right before the resurrection. This is right before the Right before Armageddon. At that point, three and a half years earlier, the Antichrist went in and defiled the temple and defiled Jerusalem. And under the authority of the Antichrist, the city of Jerusalem becomes part of the Antichrist kingdom, in a sense. In the sense that even though they're not allowed to do certain things, the, uh, excuse me, the two witnesses are actually going to stop them from doing certain things. But yet the Antichrist will be there. And whether he does or attempts to make Jerusalem his capital, he will be there. And there will be people who follow him there. And the Gentiles, i.e. the nations, i.e. the kingdom of the Antichrist, will be trampling Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is the great city of God. Again, she is the opposite of Babylon. She's supposed to be the opposite of Babylon. But under the Antichrist, there will be those even in Jerusalem. Now, I'm not saying they are Jews, but there will be Gentiles in Jerusalem who will side with the Antichrist? And so it will almost be as if you have the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan in the same place. He's attempting, he's attempting to enter the Holy of Holies. He's attempting to take God's throne. 
In reality, he can never do that. But by going in to the holy place, into the temple and setting up an image, that is what he is attempting to do. He's been kicked out of heaven. Satan has. And so he's having his proxy, the Antichrist, put himself forth as if here on earth he is taking over the kingdom of God. And Jerusalem, where the Gentiles trampling Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be an evil place. But God will rectify that. When Messiah comes, that will be rectified. The enemy will be thrown out. And the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will take his throne. So just because the Antichrist will be winning and will be taking over much of Jerusalem, if not all of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is still the place where God has placed his name. And he has not forgotten that. Satan will attempt to put his name on that place. But Babylon is the place where Satan's name is at. Satan wants God's throne. And he will use God's creation to try to get that. He will deceive many. Our job, our job is to know our calling, to follow Yeshua. Know that we are part of a chosen nation that he loves, made covenant with. We are his his wife, we are his bride. We are grafted into his nation. And that we will run the race. We'll run the good race, right? We will persevere. We will press on to the end. We will be faithful to the end. Ezekiel chapter 18 talks about those who who start off good, but then go after sin. Doesn't turn out well for them. But those who even in the beginning sin, but turn toward the ways of God, turn toward God. Those things turn out well for. Remember what we read in Daniel chapter 11. Even those who know their God, some of them, some of them, who have wisdom, some of them will even stumble and will need help getting back up. But they will press on toward the mark. We have to be careful. We have to be aware. We have to understand what is at stake. And we have to know who is who. We have to know who is who. That is the importance of what Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 24, when he talked about if someone says they're in the desert, don't believe them. That he's in the desert, don't believe them. Someone says he's in the inner room, don't believe them. No. We know how he will return. He will return in the clouds just like he left. And when he does, he will call forth his people to himself and we will return with him. Amen? We have to know who is who. We have to know what God's word says about who God is, who Messiah is, who Satan is, who the Antichrist is. We have to know the players. So that we can be sure to follow God, to follow Yeshua, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Word made flesh. Amen.
We have to follow him and no one else. And we cannot let the concern of money, fortune, greed, or even necessities get in our way of following the one who is true. Amen. Amen. Now I want to say something really quick here at the end. I don't know if you noticed, ladies, but our video last week got more views than anything I've ever done. And I have to tell you, it really bothered me. And the reason it bothered me was because It was about the enemy. The topic was the enemy. The topic was, well, yes, we hone it in and we bring it back to God, most definitely and for sure. But the, the title was about the enemy. The, the, the tags, many of the tags were about the enemy. And it saddens me to think that more people are interested in hearing about the enemy and who the enemy may potentially be than hearing about who God is, who he is, what he has done for us and what he will do. We have to be careful. I don't want us to go after um, these fanciful things. We have to stay the course and keep our eyes on Yeshua. The testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. Moses wrote about Yeshua. God's word is about Yeshua. God gave us his word so that we would know who Messiah is is so that we would know his son so we would know him and his son what does what does john say in john 17 actually it's not john saying it's yeshua praying it what is eternal life eternal life is to know the one true god and yeshua the messiah whom he has sent that is eternal life. And whereas we have to be as wise as serpents to know who the enemy is and understand his schemes, to know and have an idea of who his people and his proxies are going to be. But we also have to be as innocent as doves and follow our king. Amen? So I just wanted to share that from my heart because that did bother me. Um, of all the ones that got so many for it to be on that. Let's proclaim God. Let's proclaim his kingdom. Let's proclaim our Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ladies, Lord willing, I'll see you next week. And if you are in our area, Lord willing, I will see you on Shabbat. Amen. Shalom.